So Paul, this is uh, kind of a different story than what we saw with planets uh, discovered by radio velocity and transits where you know, we had some really exciting results first up uh, and then it's been kind of disappointing. We haven't seen so much as opposed to a long, hard slog and then suddenly a flood of events. Yeah, it's, it's been a bit weird that with radio velocity is your 51 peg, the first discovery, and then a whole flood when they did surveys, ditto for transits. Uh, but here, you know, first results exciting, and then the surveys that found nothing. But actually, this is a very common occurrence in science, that you get a really exciting first result, and then everyone storms into the field and, and does surveys and the like and don't find anything. I guess it's because whenever you make an observation, there's an element of chance. Yeah. It could be, look, end up being looking easy. You might... Uh, it might be more exciting than you expect or less exciting just from chance. So, for example, if a particular phenomenon is rare, you might get lucky and see it the first time, or uh, you might, um, even though it's a common phenomenon, you might get unlucky and not see it. But the trouble is it's those rare occasions when things look more exciting than they really are. If that gets published in a top journal, everyone gets very excited and goes and replicates it. Whereas if it looked less exciting, then everyone doesn't bother following it all up. Yeah, so there is this natural selection effect. So. I guess uh, you know, it doesn't always happen, but it can happen where you really just get lucky and find the really exciting bit first up and you're actually chasing, uh, well, we're, we're chasing something that's not as, as good as you think it's going to be. Yes, I mean, from my own experience, um, I was once trying to pioneer a new technique to discover very distant galaxies. And we went for the very first observing run and we saw the spectacular thing, what's now called a Lyman Alpha blob. And so we said, yay, this is so exciting. We went back and got lots more telescope time and looked again and again and again and saw nothing. Yeah. Eventually, you know, decades later, people have got much more sensitive telescopes and now seeing these things everywhere. But we just got really lucky the first time. But if we'd been really unlucky, we wouldn't have bothered following it all up. Yeah, you wouldn't have gotten the telescope time. And so, uh, in some sense, that chance was both good and bad for you. That's right. So where to from now? We've got sort of mixed results, a few really interesting discoveries, but we're only seeing very massive, very hot, very young things. Uh, is there any hope of seeing smaller, more normal planets? Well, uh, I think we're really going to have to you know, uh, defer to new technology, but there's a lot of scope for technology. So right now, we're in the process of building new adaptive optic systems for largest telescopes on planet Earth. And these are quite clever. So instead of using one deformable mirror, they use multiple ones, so you can make, you can take out the little scale stuff and take out the large scale stuff, or you can actually take out different bits and pieces of what's going on in the atmosphere, and you can do it faster and faster. So that's one 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 area where we can improve. Yeah, and uh, one one of the mirrors can often be used to take out this. Uh, errors in the t telescope itself, which is causing the big problem for these things. And they also use spectroscopy, so they actually measure a spectrum at every point rather than just an image, um, with the idea that the spectra of the ex exoplanet will look different from everything else, but the distortions will be the same. So yep. they should be able to get exquisite precision. So these will be coming online in the next few years. And the other cool thing they can do is to use the wave nature at light to set up a system where the starlight cancels each other out, so you actually set up you know, those slits using Huygens' principle so that the light from the stars cancels itself out in a very clever configuration of how the light comes through the telescope so that you minimize, again, that scattered stuff. That's the problem behind all these observations. So hopefully when these instruments come online, we should see a flood of uh, planet direct imaging discovery. So then the... Because uh... we're almost sure it's there. We see all these de debris disks. The only way that makes sense to me is to have something like Neptune stirring things up. So we're pretty sure there's stuff there. It's just a matter of getting the technology to the point where we can see them. And then everything will turn to actually characterizing these things, looking at the spectra. What would be really interesting is if you can start finding smaller planets by this technique, maybe even Earth-like ones, and just try looking for biomarkers, some signs that it could be inhabited. For example, the Earth has an oxygen atmosphere. If you can see yep. oxygen spectra, because the oxygen on Earth is not natural, it's produced by living things. I guess that means it is natural, but it's not produced by... Uh, if there wasn't any life on Earth, there wouldn't be any oxygen in our atmosphere. Or, or maybe there is something like us making CFCs or, you know, uh, uranium through a nuclear explosion. Who knows? The, the possibilities are endless. So that's where it gets really exciting, but that's but, going to need another generation of telescopes. Yeah. We're not going to be doing it with our current telescopes. We really need big ones, so... Very good adaptive optics and very big telescopes. Yeah. But it's all possible. And the future, it's not 10 years, it's not, it's not five years away, but it's not 100 years away necessarily either.